Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing. We are doers of your word and we'll see the fruit of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on a lot of important messages about in the past few months about the New Testament commandments and then most recently about the judgment that is coming upon the end time church which comes before the judgment comes on the world. And we saw in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, that's the church, and if it begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? <laughs> oh, they're in trouble for sure. And if the righteous, which are the only ones that are going to come through victorious, scarcely, for you here for the first time, we bring up information that is pertinent to understand what's being said. In the lower window, it brings up words. And this word here, mollus, means, in the Greek, means with difficulty and not easily. If the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, not be saved, that it's already happened, but are being saved, which is what it says in the Greek, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now the reason we say that is because this is a present tense verb. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. And it's a passive voice, meaning that the one who is the subject, the righteous, is being acted upon by somebody else, which is the Lord accomplishing that salvation work in us. So if the righteous, you and me, are being saved continuously, the ongoing process as you and I are working out our own salvation, doing what the Word says, that's the ones that are going to come through. Only the righteous. Where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? They are in trouble. We see over in Matthew chapter 13, speaking about the righteous who are going to come through, it's only the righteous that are going to make it in these days. In Matthew 13, 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. It's only the righteous. All the wicked, all the ungodly are going to be punished. We see in Matthew 25, verse 46, where it speaks, These go away into everlasting punishment, talking about all those ones that did not do what he told them to do, but the righteous into life eternal. It's only the righteous that are going to make it again. And we see in the new heavens and the new earth that is going to be coming, 2 Peter 3, verse 13, look what it says. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. The old, gonna, this one's going to be burned up and eliminated. Wherein dwelleth righteousness? Only the righteous make it. Only the righteous are going to be in this new heavens and the new earth. And only the righteous are going to come through the judgment that's coming on the church. So therefore, we must be righteous to have eternal life. We must have right, be righteous to get into the kingdom of, with the Father and the new heavens and new earth. And we must be righteous to come through victorious in the judgment that is coming. So righteousness is absolutely essential. We must realize that man was made in the image of God and was righteous before God when he was made. But that's what happened because man is not righteous now unless he has come in line with the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 2, we see what happened in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. God said to man, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. It actually, in the Hebrew, literally, there's two words for die. This, there's a word die, and if I move the cursor over, there's another word that comes up. And this is in the Hebrew. You can see them. This is one word for die, infinitive, and this is the next word for die, saying that you will die. Because what it is saying is this, as Young's brings out, in dying thou shalt die. Because what happened to man when he disobeyed God and partook of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? 
he died immediately. But that didn't cause physical death. It was a spiritual death. Spiritual separation from God. That is what spiritual death is. And then he died some 930 years later. Here we see in Genesis 3, 6, when he made the mistake, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He knew what he was doing. He participated in this and therefore died spiritually immediately. He was separated from God. After the fall of mankind, now Satan became the god of this age, the god of the world, and had the lease and control of the world for the 6,000 years that was given unto the hands of man. And the state of man after the fall, of course, was he was under spiritual death. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we see the statement, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, he let it in, and death by sin, that's the result of it, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, because every per person that was produced after that was spiritually separated from God. He was not right in spirit any longer. He was now flesh and not right with God. We see even the statement in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it's written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. No righteous ones at all were in the earth. In fact, we even come down to an Ecclesiastes and we speak, see something as well. Chapter 7, in verse 20, the statement that's made. For there is not a just or righteous man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There wasn't one. Notice also that righteousness involves not just a state of being that you are in, but it's what you do. Here it speaks that there isn't a just man, a righteous man who's doing good and not sinning. And everybody is in that state after the fall of man. So, what's, this, what's the answer for man? God wanted to restore, of course, man. And he can be restored, but he's got to be restored back to righteousness. Now, because man's in that state, can he do anything about it himself? No, not himself. The only one who can do it is God, is the one. We see the statement made in Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45, verse 21. He says, Tell you and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this from the ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there's no God else beside me, a just, that's a righteous God, and a Savior. There's none beside me. He's the only one that's righteous, God. And He's the only one that can bring the salvation and bring us, save mankind from the state that He was in. So what needed to happen for God to be able to accomplish this restoration to righteousness? Well, first of all, the price had to be paid for sin. Redemption had to be accomplished. But remember, God's the one who had to do that. So what's the result here? What had to be done? It begins in John 1.14. The Word, who is the second person of the Godhead, was made flesh. He took upon Himself physical body and dwelt or tabernacled among us. So the second person of the Godhead, who they called his name Jesus, which means he will save us from our sins, he's the one who came, and that's God, becoming a man. And what did he come to do? He come to bring salvation and the way he would do it because he is the righteous one who could accomplish this. We see in Zechariah chapter 9, after his earthly ministry and when he was going to be coming in, this is a prophesied of him coming in, when he was going to be going to the cross. Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, this means righteous, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the fowl of an ass. He's the just one. 
He's having salvation and he's bringing it to see man be restored. We see how this is going to happen in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, we pick up over in verse 11, speaking of what Jesus did. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, speaking about the Father, seeing what, what Jesus was doing. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, Jesus, justify or bring to righteousness many, which would be mankind, for he shall bear their iniquities. He was going to take the sin of mankind upon himself. And that's exactly what he came and he accomplished. We see in Hebrews chapter 9 the statement about him in verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's the one who paid the price. Somebody had to pay the price for sin. And Jesus did it with his sacrifice of himself. We see in Hebrews 10, 12, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, not continually like they did in the Old Testament, we're simply covering over for the dealing with the sins in the Old Testament era till the one who could accomplish the sacrifice for sins to accomplish the redemption, that was Jesus, only one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. He accomplished the redemption. Now, there's more that we see that had to be done. He paid the price, but that didn't restore man to righteousness yet. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 18, it says this, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. The Father reconciled man to himself through, or this means here by Jesus Christ. And notice he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. This reconciliation was the exchange. This word means a change or an exchange, and the reconciliation refers to the exchange. An exchange had to occur. What kind of an exchange had to occur? The old spirit had to be taken out and eliminated, and a new spirit had to come in. That was the exchange that had to occur. We see in verse 19, to wit or to know that God was in Christ, reconciling, bringing this exchange of the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He wasn't charging their sins against them. Man could do nothing. He was already in the state of being a sinner and continually sinning. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the word that's going to bring forth the exchange. Every person has to get this exchange. What is this exchange? It is getting a brand new spirit. It is exchanging the old dead spirit, dead to God, separated from God, for a new spirit that is right with God. We see that this was actually prophesied and declared that this was going to happen in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, in verse 26. He said, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Brand new spirit, new heart is going to come into us. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. So the exchange had to occur in order to bring man back into relationship with him because his spirit was separated from God and he was in dead in trespasses and sins. He was a sinner. Now Jesus, is, of course, is the one who accomplished all this. And not only did he pay the price for sin, but he's the one who had to get the new spirit for us. And that's what happened after he'd paid the price in hell for three days and three nights. He was the first born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. We see this declared, Revelation 1.5, from Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and the first begotten. The word here means the firstborn. He is the firstborn. Not of the dead, of those in a dead state, as far as singular, but this is the word ek, which means out of or out from, the dead people, where they all were. The reason we say that is because this is plural, 
This is the word for did, necron, which means it's plural. So that is talking about where all the dead ones were. Where were they? They were all in hell. Everybody went to hell. Nobody could go to heaven. After man died, everybody went to hell. The ones that were the ungodly went to the lowest pit in torment. But the ones who were righteous by faith in the sense of, of believing in God and walking in His ways but never could be changed in spirit, of course, they still had, they had a spirit that was not right with God. They had to go to hell and they went into the upper compartment which was Abraham's bosom. So here we see the firstborn out of the dead. And we see that this was of a necessity because you and I had to get a brand new spirit. And we couldn't get it for ourselves. God had to get it for us. Not only pay the price for the redemption, but also to get a new spirit for us. We see in Colossians 1.15, speaking of him, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature or of all creation. These are all singular. He's the firstborn. He got the brand new spirit for us. A spiritual birth occurred. He got a brand new spirit for mankind. He got it for himself, of course, at that point, having accomplished redemption. But then, of course, he got it for everybody, available for everybody. And we see in verse 18, speaking, he's the head of the body of the church. As he was the beginning of the church. And what is the church? It's the church of firstborns. That's what the true church is. Who's the beginning? The firstborn out of, ek again, from the dead ones, plural again, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Again, we're talking about the dead ones, plural. And in doing so, remember, being spiritually dead and separated from the Father, he was not in relationship with the Father for a period of time when he was in hell, bearing away all the sin for mankind, paying that price. So he was made sin on the cross, but he went down to hell for three days and three nights to pay that price down there. Having accomplished that, then he was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And we see the statement made in Hebrews 1.5, Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This isn't talking about when he first came into the earth. No, he got, became a firstborn, begotten thee. And that's when he became a son again. What do you mean a son again? Because he was separated from the Father, and he wasn't a son to him when he was made sin with all the sins of mankind and went down to hell. We can see that because it says the next thing, it says, and again. Well, that means another time, a repetition. Again, a new thing that occurred. Again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Jesus came back into relationship with him as a father, and he was a son. This happened when he got born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, and he, of course, did that for mankind to get a new spirit for man because, remember, Jesus had to become a man in order to accomplish this. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, this is the firstborn, and he's talking about bringing in the firstborn. Well, where was he? He was down in hell, the firstborn. Bringing him where? Into the inhabited earth. He got brought back into the inhabited earth where was he before? He was down in the lower parts of the earth in hell. He was brought, the firstborn, into the inhabited earth. He said, let all the angels of God worship him. This shows us that Jesus became the firstborn and he got the spirit, the new spirit and the new heart that was essential for man to be able to come back in relationship with the Father. In doing so, well, that put him in the position now to be the Savior of, man, of the world. Remember, he said he's, he's the one who came to bring salvation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14 says, We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He's the Savior because no one else could get a new spirit. 
except for him, and he got it for everybody. And so he's now the source of getting a brand new spirit to be reconciled, get that exchange, come back into relationship with the Father. We see also it speaks of him as the Savior of all men over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. He's the Savior of all of mankind. So, since Jesus got this new spirit and became a firstborn, how does that affect everybody else? How can they get it? By receiving Jesus as the Savior, they can get a brand new spirit themselves. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, took him as their Lord and Savior, received him, to them gave he the power or the right, the authority, to become the children, not sons, this is the word technon, the sons of God, or excuse me, the children of God, not sons, the children of God, at technon, which means children, meaning we've been now born from a spiritual birth, or we're firstborn, we're now children of God, even to those who believe on his name. And of course, what happens? We experience a spiritual birth. Jesus pointed this out. John 3, 5, he said verily, said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's physical birth. Because you're water, in the water sack, around, you're in there in the womb, and the water breaks, and you're going to be born physically. And of the spirit, there is a birth of the phys, of spirit, of the water, which is physical birth, and there is a birth of the spirit when the Holy Spirit engulfs you and surrounds you and takes the old spirit out and brings the new spirit in when you receive Jesus. That's necessary, otherwise he can't enter into the kingdom of God. And this makes it clear what it's talking about. It's not talking about water baptism by any means. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, that is spiritual birth becoming a firstborn. That's why Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must, it's absolutely essential, be born from above. The word again means from above. And so when you get born from above, you come into this body that Jesus created, which is all creation now, into the body of Christ, the church, which is what? What is the church? The church is the church of firstborns. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. To the general assembly and church, not of the firstborn, because there's no definite article, the word the, it's not there in the Greek. And furthermore, the word firstborn is not singular. It is plural. We'll show you. Here is the word, firstborn, plural. And there's no definite article prior to this. This is an, the church, ecclesia, and this is the word for firstborn. There is no definite article before it. That's why it should be translated to the General Assembly and Church of Firstborns. That's the church. The church is church of firstborns. That's why all denominations are false. They're wrong. God didn't make any denominations. There's only one church. It's made by man. It causes separation. It's no good. They've made a mistake. They're all in error. Instead, it's the church of firstborns when you receive Jesus and you get born from above. Now, what happens? As a firstborn, we got a new spirit. Did we? What happened to the old spirit? It's taken out, remember? The exchange occurs. And this is what was spoken right before we gave you verse 18 and 19 before, but let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, this new creation. Old things are passed away, where? In spirit, not in soul and body. In spirit, because you got a brand new spirit and also a brand new heart. Behold, all things are become new. You're a new creation. You've got a brand new spirit. That's what's new. 
and all things are of God, who has reconciled the exchange to himself by Jesus Christ, given us the ministry of the reconciliation, the exchange, as we pointed out. Therefore, that tells us that Jesus accomplished this great work for us to get a brand new spirit, which is what man had to have. That's absolutely essential. Also, what else did he do that was important that we needed to do? To, this is all so you and I could come to the place of being righteous. Colossians 1.13, Who hath delivered us from the authority, exousia, of darkness, not power, the word power is dunamis in the Greek. This is the word exousia, meaning authority. Young's corrects the King James error. The authority of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom, the rule and the reign of his dear son. You and I are now in the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And you and I must be in that position because if we're going to be righteous, as you will see, we have to conquer and overcome the enemy, who is Satan. And that Satan will try to stop you from anything that is righteous. Acts chapter 10, 13, verse 10, identifies him when Paul was speaking to this sorcerer used of the enemy. He said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. The devil is an enemy of all righteousness. In fact, when we speak of what he's called here is the adversary in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, because your adversary, the devil, notice the word for adversary is the word antitikos, Anti means against. Dikos means righteous. It's from this word, which means is the one to be right or to be just. So it talks about because you're the one who is the adversary to righteousness, the devil. He's always going to try to take you away from righteousness. Because if you get you away from righteousness, then you'll sin and then you won't be righteous and you'll have given place to him, and you won't be right with God. Now, at the same time, in order to accomplish this work, we, got, we get a brand new spirit, but righteousness is more than just getting a brand new spirit. We have to see the work of God accomplished in our life in order to see us become righteous, as you will see in a moment. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, he brought us into a new covenant relationship. When you and I are born from above, getting a new spirit, we come into the new covenant that he made. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. We now come into covenant relationship with them once we're a child of God. And as a child of God, in this covenant relationship, we have all these promises, and why do we have a right to them? Because we are heirs of all the promises. Hebrews 8, 17, if children, which is what happens when we get born again, remember, we receive him, we become children of God, then heirs. When you come into a covenant, that's a will, and the ones who benefit from it are the ones who have the right at, from that will, and that is the heir. Jesus, of course, was the one who became the heir because the testator who made it died, and he then got a brand new spirit, so he's the heir of all things. And you and I become an heir in this testament of all the promises of God, all the things that God has. We're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And so now we have a right to the covenant promises and the working of God that he will accomplish in our life. And one of those things is to bring us to the place of being righteous. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. Or more literally, this is talking about the fact that he is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteous. It is the covenant-keeping name of God. 
The word Jehovah or Yahweh is the covenant-keeping name of God. There's different names for God. They all reveal who He is and what He does. This is the covenant-keeping name, meaning that He, this covenant of righteousness, will be performed by the covenant-keeping God of righteousness, who is the Lord is going to do it. That tells us something. To become righteous, we have to see the covenant promises be performed in our life to bring us to the place of being righteous. And we see that man, of course, is made of three parts, you must understand. When we got born again, we got a brand new spirit and a new heart. But what are we? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that means if we're going to be blameless, it means we're going to be walking in righteousness. We're not going to be walking in sin. And it's not just in spirit. It's spirit, soul, and body. The whole deal. You and I are to be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord, which means we're going to be walking in righteousness. So the exchange brought a new spirit and a new heart, which is right before the Lord. But, Righteousness is going to be more than just that, and that is important to understand. In understanding about righteousness, Romans tells us much. We see in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it's speaking about how we come to the place of being righteous. It couldn't be produced by the Old Testament law. The law brought the knowledge of sin. The Old Testament was simply a vehicle put in place to bring the knowledge of sin, to put in the sacrifices, to cover over and to deal with the sin until the one who would be the final sacrifice for sin would come, which is Jesus, to accomplish that and to accomplish the redemption for mankind and to bring a new covenant, which is what God purposed, into being. The law could never produce a change in spirit and bring us to the place of righteousness. The Old Testament couldn't do it. We see in Romans 3, 21, now the righteousness of God without the law, or literally this means apart from the law, because the law could never produce it, talking about the law of the Old Testament, is manifested. It was witnessed by the law and the prophets. They sp speaks of it in the Old Testament, but it could never manifest it. Instead, now it is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, and how is it going to be manifested? Well, it's through Jesus. It's the only way, because He's the one who had to get a new spirit for us, so we could receive Him and get the exchange, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. A person who believes and receives Jesus will get this new spirit, which is a righteous spirit. Of course, this is necessary because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because they don't have a spirit that's right with God and they're under the bondage as, as a sinner before they get a new spirit. Being justified or rendered righteous freely by His grace, meaning this is a God's free gift that He brings forth to us. And how did that get accomplished? Through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Somebody had to accomplish the redemption so that we could come to the place of being justified. And this is His favor, His grace towards mankind, whom God set forth, speaking of Jesus, to be a propitiation. He's the one who was the sacrifice through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness because He's the one who got the righteousness for us. For the remission, this word means the passing over, neglecting, disregarding of the sins that are past. He's not holding anybody's sins against them. That, doesn't, that didn't stop the work of God from being accomplished in anybody's life. Because what do you have to do? You just have to get a new spirit. Not try to deal with your sins. You can't even deal with them until you get a brand new spirit and come into relationship with God. Through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, because it's His righteousness that what comes into us, that He might be just, and the justifier, or the one who brings us into righteousness of those who believe in Jesus. So, of course, he says, where's boisting then? Is there any boasting for man? He can do nothing. 
It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. It's all faith in receiving what Jesus accomplished for mankind. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified or brought to the place of righteousness by faith without or apart, that means again, from the deeds of the law. It could never produce it. That's why anybody who follows the Old Testament law is deceived, thinking that that is going to produce righteousness in their life. It is not going to do it. It never could before. It's only through what Jesus did, and He brought us into the New Covenant. He finished the old. It is finished. He eliminated it. In fact, we must realize what Jesus did. The first was simply a vehicle to deal with the sins and accomplish the redemption. But we see here, this is what he says. Then said he in Hebrews 10, 9, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. What was, the, what was he going to do? He's going to take away the first, the first covenant, get rid of that, because that was simply a means for him to be able to be the final sacrifice and finish that up, because that, that wouldn't produce anything of righteousness in us or change that he may establish the second. And it's interesting when it says that he may establish, this is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood in the Greek is a conditional statement, meaning that conditions had to be met before that could be accomplished. So before he could establish the second, which is the new covenant, he had to take away the first, which is what he did, and it was final sacrifice, it was finished. The presence of God left as the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. The presence of God left. <laughs> no more was this first covenant in operation any longer. That's why we're not under the Old Testament or the law of the Old Testament. Anybody who continues to follow that is not understanding what Jesus accomplished, and they are deceived and have made great mistakes. In fact, they've fallen from grace, <laughs> and they have really uh, they put... The Jesus aside, essentially, thinking that keeping the Old Testament law would produce anything. It would do nothing. Romans chapter 4 speaks of here how Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness, but it couldn't bring a change in him. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If he just did it himself, it would be like, he owes it to me because I accomplished it. I worked it out myself. No. It's all of God's grace. His favor shown toward us because man could do nothing, remember. It was only God who could accomplish this work for us. Now we come on over to chapter 5 and we come to verse 17. For if by one man's offense, Adam's sin, death reigned by one, it came in and everybody was spiritually dead from that point on, and then physically would die later on, much more they which receive, lombano, take, means we're going to be taking something. And when it talks about us taking this, it isn't like we just took it one time and that was it. That's important to understand. Why do I say that? Because it's a present tense verb. Much more they which who are continually, ongoingly taking, because it's ongoing action, the abundance of grace, we take His grace continually every time where it's receiving the things that He's doing in us, because it's all by God's grace, not by anything we've earned, that's for sure and of the gift of righteousness, because we're continually taking the gift of righteousness. Don't think of it as just like a one-time thing that was given to you and that's it. Everything that comes from righteousness is a gift from God. It's gifts after gifts after gifts after gifts every time. All the fruits of righteousness are all coming from God, meaning you do nothing to earn anything or merit it. But you're receiving continually the gift of righteousness and this abundance of grace, which is God's working in your life, what's going to happen is you see the continual working of the grace of God and this gift of righteousness continually coming to you in your life. You're going to reign in life by one Jesus Christ. 
And that's also what he wants to bring us to, to the place of ruling and reigning, so we do not let the devil rule and reign over us, and that we now are in the kingdom and we can rule and reign over every work of the enemy. Verse 21, As sin hath reigned unto death, which it has, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we've seen something really important here. Eternal life. That's the big picture. That's who the ones are the ones that get into the eternal age with the Father and the new heavens and the new earth, the righteous ones that have come into eternal life. Notice, it's righteousness unto eternal life. But notice back here, it says, so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Now, when it says grace might reign, the word reign, might reign here is the verb, which is, again, a subjunctive mood. If you're here for the first time, don't get overwhelmed by us bringing these Greek things. That's extremely important. The subjunctive mood means a conditional statement. It's not a statement of fact. Conditions have to be met. In other words, grace might reign if conditions are met. And how does it work? Through righteousness. Because righteousness is going to be the condition whereby grace will be able to reign. Because righteousness is what produces eternal life. Meaning you're going to have to be righteous and see, see this come to bring you to the place of eternal life. So, this brings us to another thing. Because of the fact that we got a new spirit that's right with God, but we're to be spirit, soul, and body, blameless to the coming of the Lord, and that God's grace is to continually be taken hold of and this gift of righteousness continually taken hold of through righteousness working in our life, and we have to meet the conditions for that to produce eternal life, well, that's telling us something. Righteousness is going to be something that's got to come forth in our life continually. And we see this shown clearly in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, is a highly misunderstood scripture by many in the body of Christ, unfortunately. Look what it says. I'll read it as it says in the King James. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. The he is talking about the Father. Made him is speaking of Jesus. To be sin for us is speaking of mankind. Who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, because he never sinned himself, that we, mankind, might, it says, be made the righteous of God in him, meaning we can only become righteous. It's the righteousness of God in Him that comes into us. Remember, we can't earn anything or merit anything ourselves. Now, notice the first word made. I put the cursor over the word made and highlight it. Notice the Greek word below, poeo, which is meaning to make, number 4160, based on Strong's Concordance numbering system. The next word made if it's translated correctly, it should be the same Greek word. I put the cursor over that word, made. It is not. It is a different word. It is the word, number 1096, with Strong's numbering system, it's the word ginomai, which means become. Well, there's a big difference between whether I've been made or whether I become. If I'm made, it's done. If I'm going to become, it's not done, but it can, it can become down the road. And that's what it says. The Father made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, Jesus, that we might become ginomai. And when it, the righteousness of God might become, and why does it say might? Because again, it is a subjunctive mood verb. That means it's a conditional statement. That means that in order for us that we might become the righteous of God, that means conditions are going to have to be met. But also, is this something that will just, if I meet one condition, then it's done? No. How do you know? 
because it's a present tense verb, meaning that this is an ongoing working in our life statement because it's present tense, continuous repeated ongoing action. Meaning the way you would translate this is that we may continually become the righteous of God in him if conditions are met. Well, that means this is an ongoing work. That's why we saw in 1 Peter 4, 17, where it says the righteous with difficulty and not easily are being saved. Mm -hmm. The continuous, ongoing, continual work of us becoming the righteousness of God in Him. That means we've got to meet the conditions. Well, that means that there's some things we need to be doing. This is why the Scriptures tell us many things that we have to pay attention to. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, I'm supposed to be seeking after it. It doesn't mean I've already got it. I'm supposed to be seeking after it in order to get it from God. When it says, Seek ye, this is a command to you and me because it's an imperative mood. Also, it's not like I just sought it for a moment present tense, I continually, ongoingly am seeking not only the kingdom, but also righteousness, the righteousness of His righteousness. I'm continually seeking to see this come to pass. And how am I going to see it? How does God do everything? Through His Word. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13, look what it says. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Well, that tells us something. So righteousness is going to come to me through the word of righteousness working in my life. The word of righteousness is going to produce righteousness on an ongoing basis. Now, when he says the guy who uses milk, he's a baby. Well, this is someone, a brand new Christian what should he be doing? He should be doing the word of righteousness to grow up and to bring forth fruit and be, start seeing fruits of righteousness coming forth in his life. Now when it says unskillful, this is a word meaning inexperienced in. Meaning the guy who's still a spiritual baby, he's inexperienced in the word of righteousness. Well, that also tells us another thing. It's not just I heard the word and then it did, then that just automatically produced in me. I have to do something with it. If you get experienced, you're working it, you're doing it. You get experienced on a job, you get experienced in doing something, you've been working it and working it and developing and learning how to do it and putting it in operation. So we're going to be experience, get experience in the word of righteousness. And how's that going to happen? Strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. This is the guy who's not a baby anymore, he's grown up. And how did he get to that place? Even those who by reason, or this really literally means because of, because this is the word here, dia. Dia is a word that means through. Here is the word dia. It means when it has a genitive, this is a case in Greek, it means through. But if it is an accusative case, it means because of. We find the case by looking at what follows this dia. Here it is, accusative. And the next here is accusative. So what it's talking about is means because of. That's why Young's translates it correctly here. Even those who because of the use. And what's the use mean? Habit. Well, that means I'm doing something continually because of habit. Hearing and doing, hearing and doing, hearing and doing, experience, working it, working it, working it, working it, carrying it out. That's what we're doing. That's why we're continual hearers and doers of the word of righteousness to see it produce results in us. Now, this is so important because the teaching that's been prevailing in the body of Christ is once you're born again, you're perfectly righteous, and it's set. Well, we've already seen that's not so because we saw the conditions that are necessary to be ongoingly become righteous, and we see 
Here, the guy is supposed to get experienced in the word of righteousness through habit to grow up in the things of God. And the fact that when we get born again, we only get a brand new spirit and a heart, but our soul and body has not been changed, that we have to see something be accomplished. And what happens as we hear and do the word of righteousness? Philippians 1.11 says, one of the things that he prayed for them, this is a prayer that he's praying for the church at Philippi, and one of the things was being filled with the fruits of righteousness. How do fruits come? Something grows up to become a fruit. The word growing in us by habit produces the fruits of righteousness. And we're not talking about just a fruit, fruits, plural. Oh, that's lots of fruits of righteousness in all kinds of areas of our life. The teaching that says we're perfectly righteous when we're born again and that's all there is to it is a lie. It's the beginning step. It brought a new spirit and a new heart into us so that now we can do the word of righteousness and see it produce in the soulish realm, bringing the fruits forth. And also, we'll talk about in a moment what we do with this body which has sin dwelling in it. First of all, we come down to verse John chapter 2 and see further to show that this teaching that says you're perfectly righteous is false. And the reason we have to cover this because if it's the righteous that are in to get eternal life and the righteous are going to be in the new heavens and new earth, we better sure be sure we understand it because this is the big picture. 1 John 2.29 If you have known a perfect tense verb meaning action completed in the past with present results now. If you have known, literally that would be, that he is righteous, and we have, you know continually, because this is its ongoing work, that everyone who is doing righteousness, present tense, well, that's more than just I got a brand new spirit. I must be doing something continually. What am I doing? The word of righteousness continually. That's how you're doing righteousness. Has been born of him. And this is not talking about the fact that just an occurrence happened in the past and that was it. Because this is a perfect tense verb implying that something happened in the past that has an ongoing effect that's in, that is shown in the present effect now, because perfect tense means completed action in the past with present effects now. Meaning, I was born in the past and it has the present effects now. What's evidence of that? Because I'm doing righteousness continually. God wants everyone to be doing righteousness. That produces the fruits of righteousness. Look at verse 4. Whosoever is doing, poeo not only means make, but it also means do, depending upon the majority of times it means do, 357 times. That's why Young's brings it out this. And also, it is a present tense, so that's why you would translate it is doing, showing the ongoing action. Whoever is doing sin, the sin, What's he doing? He is doing, same word, poyo, lawlessness. Transgressing the law or doing lawlessness. The reason we say lawlessness is because the word law is nomos. But the Greek word actually used here is a nomia. A is a prefix meaning not. And nomos is law, otherwise not law. That's why it means lawlessness. Literally, it says, everyone who is doing the sin, he is doing lawlessness. Well, if you're doing lawlessness, are you righteous? No way. <laughs> you're not. People that do lawlessness, they're lawbreakers. They're not righteous. They're unrighteous. For sin is the lawlessness, literally. There is no... Uh, the, the transgression of the law is just one Greek word. Sin is 
As I put a cursor over it, you see me pull across, you see one Greek word comes up, anomia. Sin is lawlessness. Well, if I commit sin, I'm lawless, and that means I'm certainly not going to be righteous whatsoever. Now, verse 5. Now you have known, because these, tell, you know, perfect tense, we have known in the past with the present results of what Jesus came to do, that he was manifested to take away our sins. More literally, it's not a good translation. This is a Hina clause. The Hina means in order that. That's why he translates it that, that or in order that. Our sins take away. You see, if you just read it in the King James, you'll never figure out what it's talking about. To take away, it looks like it's an infinitive, and it's all gone. No. This is not an infinitive. It is a subjunctive mood statement, meaning it's conditional. That's why we put Young's up here, that our sins he may take away. That's the conditional statement. In other words, we've known that he was manifested, that he might take away, in order that he might take away our sins. So are our sins taken away when we got born again? No, we just got a brand new spirit. Our sins have to be taken away when we have confessed them and repented and turned away from them so we don't continue in them. That he might take away our sins. That means conditions have to be met in order to take away the sins. Now, we come to verse 6. Whosoever is abiding in him, he's not sinning because he's walking in the way of righteousness. He's doing the word. Whosoever is sinning has not seen him or has no, not known him. Because are we to be sinning any longer from God's perspective once we're born again? No. Why? Not only did you get a new spirit and a new heart, but you have to realize... This new spirit is not a sinner spirit. It is not, you're not a sinner any longer. You are now one with a righteous spirit. You are released from the bondage and imprisonment of sin. You're not a sinner any longer. That's why we're commanded to not sin any longer, as you will see. Then we come to verse 7. Little children... And this is an important verse. Let no man deceive you. Why would God say let nobody deceive you? Because in his foreknowledge about this subject that will be taught in the body of Christ down the road, including in this age now, he knows there's a problem with the teaching. Because everybody thinks that once you're born again, you're perfectly righteous. That's the prevailing teaching in almost all circles taught out there in the Christian church. It is great error. Notice says, he says, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, they didn't tell me that one. They told me I was perfectly righteous when I got born again. Did they tell you this verse? I don't remember this one. I wonder why. Hmm. Present tense. It would destroy their teaching, that's why. He who is doing, present tense, the righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, that means righteousness is more than just getting a new spirit. It involves you doing the righteousness, doing the word of righteousness. So you have the fruits of righteousness. So you are continually becoming righteous, as we've seen from all these scriptures already. And then this scripture really is setting it straight. Verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. You mean to tell me if I'm running around walking in lawlessness and sin and all these things, I'm not of God? That's right. How can that be? Because you're not righteous anymore. 
And if you're not righteous, you're not right with God whatsoever. Look what it says. The word doeth. And we're talking about someone who's continually doing this. Because if you confess sin, you're going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and you're going to confess it and repent and turn and get away from it right away. You know, you're okay, going to be okay be as long as you repent. But if you continue to walk in that righteousness, un un unrighteousness and not doing righteousness, you're not of God. Well, that means who are the ones that are of God? The ones who are doing righteousness continually are the ones that are of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. If you're not loving your brother, you're not of God either. Well, we know that that's true because verse 14 says, We know we pass from death into life because we love the brother. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Death is not eternal life. <laughs> it means if I'm not loving my brother, I don't have eternal life. We know it from the next verse. Clear as a bell. Whoso hates his brother is a murderer, and we know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And this is talking about a Christian to a Christian because it's talking about hating his brother. That's a believer. Therefore, someone who is not doing righteousness is not of God, and someone who is not loving his brother is not of God, and he's not having eternal life abiding in him. This totally destroys the teaching on righteousness in almost every circle out there in the body of Christ, and it is a shame that it does. It sh everybody should not be teaching what they're teaching. Now, Romans chapter 6 is important to understand. Verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, not the best translation, because it's not talking about a state that we are dead in a state. It's a verb. This is a, has a tense and a voice and a mood. It's a verb. It literally says, how shall we who died to sin? That's right. When did I die to sin? When you got a brand new spirit because there was an exchange. Mm -hmm. The old spirit, gone. It's dead. It's eliminated. Brand new spirit comes into you, the spirit of Christ. You died to being a sinner and the sin nature. It's done. It's finished. How can I live any longer therein? If I died to it and I'm not a sinner any longer and I got a different spirit, well, how can I continually be doing this? There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. For he, not that is dead, is a state of being. Again, this is why you have to look at know these things Otherwise, people will have all kinds of teaching that's just way off base. This is a verb again. It's got a tense voice and mood. He who did die, aorist tense is a simple past tense. He who did die or has died, I'd, I'd translate this better, had died would really be a perfect tense. This is better translated. He who did die is freed from sin, has been freed from sin, because this one is a perfect tense. So it's literally saying, who, he who did die, which we did, the old us is dead and gone, has been set free from sin in the past with present effects at this time of speaking. You're set free forever in the sense of the fact you've got a brand new spirit. That doesn't mean you can't sin, but the brand new spirit you have, you're freed from sin. So if we're freed from sin, why in the world would we be sinning any longer? We shouldn't be. Verse 11. See, if you believe the teaching that we're always a sinner, you know, we're saved by grace, but we're still a sinner, we know we're always going to sin. So, you know, if we sin, we try our best. Throw that teaching out the window, it's lies from the devil as well. You'll never take a stand against it. You know, if you kind of fall into it, well, you know. No, no, no. That's not God. Look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. I'm dead to sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's right. I'm alive unto God now. I'm not a sinner. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Why? What's the problem with the body? The body didn't get changed. It still has sin dwelling in it. Sin's dwelling in the flesh. When it says, let not sin, it's not like, try my best to not let it reign. No, because when it says here about letting not sin reign, this is a command. It's a command to you and me. Do not let sin reign. God would never command me to do something if I couldn't do it. I mean, that'd be unfair. I command you to do it, but I know you can't do it. Because you're a sinner and you're always going to sin. See, why haven't people thought this? How can they go along with their teaching? It's wrong. Do not sin, therefore. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And it wasn't just for a moment, present tense, continually in your life. How would I let it reign in my body, my mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof? How's it working through the lusts that are in the body, the strong desires? How would I let it have, operate if I obey it? Mm -hmm. I must not let myself obey it. To be obeying it, present tense, essentially not should, but to be obeying it. That's why Young did a pretty good job on most things. To be obeying it in the lust thereof. Meaning you have to obey it. You mean to tell me I don't have to obey it? That's right. You mean if I sin with my body, I'm responsible for obeying it? That's right. You can't say the devil made me do it. <laughs> you didn't obey it. Oh, God's word. And you obeyed the strong desires, those lusts of the flesh. Not only are we commanded to not let our body do this, what about the soulish realm? Neither yield ye your members, that's all your faculties, what I see, what I hear, what I speak, what I put my hands to, what I walk in, what I'm thinking upon, all my members, all my faculties. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. What produces sin? Something that's unrighteous. That would be contrary to righteousness. And when it says, neither yield ye, this is also a command. He's just saying, do not yield your members as, in, as, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. I'm commanding you. And not just for a moment again, throughout your life, period, forever, present tense, ongoing. But there's something else you got to do. You can't say, well, I'm not going to do that. You need to do something proactive, which is what? Yield yourselves unto God. And this is a command. And this is interesting that it doesn't use the present tense. The aorist tense, just as a simple statement, it's simply saying, yield yourselves unto God, which is something we should do at a point in time, and, and that's the way we live from now on. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, un, of righteousness unto God. My eyes only want to see something that's righteous. I'm not watching that program. I'm not watching that garbage. My ears are only to listen to things. I'm not going to listen to that stuff. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to think on that. I'm going to take that thought captive. I'm not going to speak those evil words. My members, I'm commanded to yield unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, or lordship, this actually means. It's not supposed to be lord over you or rule over you. You mean to tell me if I'm, I'm sinning, I'm actually letting it rule over me? That's right. It's not like I just kind of committed something and fell into it. You just let it rule over you. Just like Adam let the devil rule over him when he sinned. You're letting the enemy rule over you through the sin, because that's what he's against all righteousness, remember. 
For you're not under the law, under the Old Testament, but you're under grace, the New Testament, because under the Old Testament you couldn't do anything about it. You were still a sinner. You didn't have a new spirit. But now under the New Testament, aha, I'm not one any longer. Verse 16, know ye not, you're to know this. And if we don't know this, there's something wrong. Know ye not, or more literally, this would be better translated because it's a perfect tense. Have you not known in the past with present results now? Kind of an indictment against them if they didn't know it. You should have known this. Haven't you known this? That to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. Well, this now has brought it to some, not just to yielding to a thing like sin. Now it's talking about to whom? Well, that's a person. Well, that means that if I'm yielding to sin, I'm not just yielding to sin, I'm yielding to a person. And who would that be? The devil. To whom you yield yourselves. You can never say the devil made me do it. You yielded yourself to the devil. Servants, you yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. You mean to tell me that I could be a born again Christian and be yet a servant of the devil at the same time? Yeah. If you're yielding your members of sin unto death. But what should I be yielding myself to then as a servant of? The word of righteousness, and how do I yield myself to it? By obedience. Well, that means I've got to do something. That's right. That's why it says doing righteousness, obeying righteousness. Just like how do I sin? I have to obey the lust of the flesh. I'm not going to obey that. I'm going to disobey that lust of the flesh. I'm going to obey righteousness. And what does obedience of the word produce? Righteousness. See, that's why he says the proof of you all is whether you're obedient in all things. Obedience shows whether we're righteous or not. And it's going to be evident by, how do you, how's God know us? By our fruits. By what? The fruits of righteousness, right? The fruits of righteousness are going to be evident in our life. Verse 17. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. When were we the servants of sin? Before we got born again. But you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered you. The gospel that told me, receive Jesus, get a brand new spirit, get the exchange. Get rid of that, that uh, being a servant of sin, sinner's uh, spirit. Being then made free from sin, which you are. And who did this? God did it because it's a passive voice, meaning that someone else produced this result for you. Jesus did it by giving you a brand new spirit when you received him. You became the servants of righteousness. In fact, it even really means a slave, essentially. Give yourself wholly to serving righteousness. Why? Because you have a spirit that is righteous now. Therefore, you're a servant of righteousness. You have a righteous spirit. There's no excuse for us yielding to anything outside of what is of our spirit. Because we're to walk in spirit. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or weakness of your flesh. Can you ever walk by the flesh and be right with God? No, because sin dwells in it. For as you've yielded your members in the past, servants to uncleanness and to anomia, lawlessness, which produced more lawlessness in your life, even so now, see that's what we were before, but now we are born again. Even so now, yield your members... And again, this is a command to you and me. Yield your members, servants to righteousness. I'm going to only speak righteousness. I'm going to think righteousness. I want to uh, hear righteousness. I'm going to walk in the ways of righteousness. I'm not going to be involved in anything that's not. What is that going to produce? Holiness. 
And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Because righteousness, fruits of righteousness, produces holiness. You'll see that. He says, you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. That's right. As long as we were a sinner, we weren't righteous. But fruit had you in those things wherever you're now ashamed. <laughs> Everything was bad, right? The end of those things is death. Being now made free from sin, brand new spirit, become servants to God, which we are, you have your fruit, or you are having, present tense, your fruit unto holiness. Why am I having continually my fruit unto holiness? Because I'm obeying the Word, producing fruits of righteousness, and that continual fruits of righteousness is producing holiness. And what's the end result of that? Everlasting life. That is the big picture. So, that tells us that those people who are telling you that you're perfectly righteous have told you error when you're born again. It is probably one of the most abominable teachings in the body of Christ today that has deceived the multitudes. What a sad situation. Chapter 7. Here's where Paul, now he's dealing with the body. We jump down to verse 18, and he says, he's having this problem. The thing that I want to do, I'm not doing. The things that I don't want to do, I am doing. What a mess. Yeah. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Because your body didn't get changed. It still has sin in it. For the will's present with me. I want to do the right thing. That's coming from the inner man. How to perform that which is good, I find not. The good that I will to do, I'm not doing. The evil that I will not to do, essentially, that I'm doing. I don't want to do this stuff, but I'm doing it. Now, if I do that that I will not, that I'm willing not to do, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. It says something else is driving me. That's right, sin is dwelling you, and you're obeying something that's in you. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil's present with me. See, if you think that when you, get, you want to do something and something's not going to be working against you, trying to hinder you, of course it's hindering you. It's going to come. Evil's present with you, trying to stop you from doing the things of God. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like getting in the Word. I feel like going and doing some of these things that uh, other people are doing that I know are wrong. Well, that's because evil's present with you. <laughs> it wants you to do these evil things. You've got to deal with that, see. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the inner man on the inside. I always want to do right from the inner man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. The war is on in your mind bringing me into captivity, the law of sin that's in my members, because your members didn't get changed, see? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Because sin dwells in it, it is a body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, which is what you're to do. With the flesh, you'll serve the law of sin. So that brings us to the place of where your mindset is. Because remember, your soul didn't get changed, your mind didn't get changed, but your mind can be changed by the renewing of it through the Word in you. So you think correctly. I'm going to get my mind renewed so that I serve the law of God. And so I will not give place to those desires of the flesh and that law of sin operating in it. So, there is therefore now no condemnation or judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The key comes down to, are you walking after the Spirit? That would be walking after the Word. What are my Spirit would walk after. If I'm walking after the flesh, I'm walking in sin, I will be condemned and I will be judged. And that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It will be fulfilled in us by what we're walking after continually. 
So now it comes down to what kind of a walk do you have consistently in your life? You need to be having a walk that is walking in the right way, present tense, which you're walking after continually. This is why then it comes to about your mind. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Where's your mindset? If your mindset's after the things of the spirit, then that's where you'll be moving towards and doing. Well, how does my mind get after the spirit? After the word, because the word is the way of the spirit. If you're not thinking of what the word says, you won't be having a mind after the spirit. If you're just following your feelings or whatever I want to do or my thoughts without considering what the word says, you'll be following after the flesh. Carnally minded, fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, word ruled minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is an en enmity against God. It's actually an enemy against him. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, because it doesn't have the word in it. It wants to do what it wants to do. And you're not going to do that. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God when you're in the flesh. There's no way. Now, we come to verse 10. If Christ be in you, brand new spirit, the body's dead because of sin. It, it didn't get changed. It's still dead. It's still in a, that spiritually, it's still a dead state, sin dwelling in it. It, can, it. That produces no life, no righteousness. But the spirit is life. Why? Because of righteousness. So if I walk after the spirit, I'll walk in righteousness and I'll be righteous. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Notice it's a way of life. There's a lot of Christians that live after the flesh. What are you doing? How can you live after the flesh? You got a brand new spirit and yet you're going to live after the flesh? You don't even realize what in the world's happened. Or else you're just denying the Lord's working in your life. You're certainly not letting him have dominion and lordship in your life to bring you to what he wants. And why would you be, why would he consider you righteous if you're living after the flesh? He doesn't. That's for sure. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Uh, that doesn't mean having eternal life, does it? If you through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Therefore, we're going to get our mind renewed so we think correctly in the soulless realm and choose right. And we're going to put to death the deeds of the body and walk in line with the Word, with my mind serving the law of God. As I do that, then I will walk in the ways of the Lord. And I want to just bring it, I know we're a little bit over, just bring up one other thing real quick that you also need to realize. Again, the prevailing teaching has been you're perfectly righteous when you're born again. In fact, they will acknowledge that it's through your faith, that's right, by receiving Jesus, but they'll say you are even saved by faith alone and perfectly righteous by faith alone. That's it. It's done. Mm -mm. James 2, talking about how faith without works is dead. Verse 24. And what, this is in response to what it said about how, in verse 21, how Abraham, her father, he was justified by works when he offered Isaac a son upon the altar. He couldn't say, yeah, I believe what you say, and then I'm not going to go do it. No, he had to go do it, didn't he? Faith wrought together with his works. By works was faith made perfect or came to completion. Otherwise, faith has works. Abraham believed God, imputed him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God, and he showed it forth because he did what God told him to do. You see then how that by works a man is justified or declared righteous and not by faith only or alone. So that's another teaching out there that says we're justified by faith alone. It's a lie from the pit of hell as well. It's not from God. It's a lie. It's from the devil. 
In other words, our faith coupled together with our works produces the justification or righteous. What am I doing? I'm working the word. I'm doing the word of righteousness. I'm working righteousness. Otherwise, what, like for instance, what's my, what's my work when I get born again? Well, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That's great. Well, didn't it say you're supposed to do something then? Many has received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. Well, my work is receiving him. Well, I believe that God's healing, God is going to heal me. Great. You've got faith. Is that producing healing flowing in your body? No. Therefore, I'm going to come boldly to the throne of grace and take hold of his mercy of healing and thank him that his healing power is flowing into my body now. That's me working my faith. And guess what? It's happening. I believe God will deliver me from these evil spirits that are tormenting my mind. Great. You got faith for it. Is that getting you delivered? No. You spirits in my mind, come out of me in the name of Jesus. That's my working my faith to start driving them out to get set free. In other words, faith has works. Works of righteousness, of doing His word, in order to produce the result. The bottom line from this you must see is that righteousness is the big picture to be getting eternal life, to entering into the eternal age with the Father, to pass the test when the judgments are coming on the church. Therefore, we've got to get not just born again, but get our mind renewed to the truth and walk in line with the Word, doing the Word, working the Word, the Word of righteousness continually, bringing forth fruits of righteousness, becoming continually righteous, yielding our members unto righteousness, knowing I'm dead to sin because I'm not a sinner any longer. Therefore, I will not let my body reign, the lust of the flesh reign over me. Sin will not reign. I will not let it reign in me by obeying the lust of the flesh. Sin's not going to reign in me anymore. And I'm not going to yield my members unto it anymore. I'm going to yield myself to God by obedience to the Word that produces righteousness. And the fruits of righteousness brings forth holiness and everlasting life. And I'm not about to live after the flesh. I'm getting my mind renewed to the truth and I'm going to choose the way of the Lord and I will not give place to anything that is contrary to the Word of God. I'm going to live after the Spirit, not after the flesh. And I am going to work the Word, showing my faith to produce the righteousness in my life because it's shown by the fruits because of me working my faith. That's the bottom line from what we see. It destroys all these false teachings. I trust this has helped you as we've begun to talk about righteousness. We have to understand this. And we have to understand all the false teaching out there that has deceived 90 plus percent of the body of Christ, maybe 99 percent for most of all, all of them believe the lie that they're perfectly righteous and they've been deceived. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God is the truth. I thank you that Jesus accomplished the redemption and made the way for me to get a new spirit because he became a firstborn. And I become a firstborn when I receive Jesus and I get a new spirit and a new heart. Having a new spirit and a new heart, I am dead to sin. I have a spirit that's righteous. And now I can live after the Spirit according to the Word of God that is the Word of righteousness and become continually righteous as I do the Word of righteousness. I understand those who are continually doing righteousness are righteous. I will continually do the Word of righteousness. I will not let any sin reign in my mortal body by obeying the lusts of it. 
I will choose to do what the Word says, and I will not yield any members unto unrighteousness, knowing I'm yielding to a whom, which is the devil. I will not yield to the devil. I will yield to God by yielding my members obedient to the Word of God, producing righteousness. And as the fruits of righteousness are continually coming forth, I am righteous, producing holiness, producing everlasting life. And I will pass the test in the judgment coming to the church. And I will be one of those who are in the new heavens and the new earth where dwelling is righteousness because I will be righteous. Thank you for the truth coming to me this day. I will walk in righteousness and I will see that I will have the fruits of righteousness all the days of my life and I will be seen and shown to be and declared to be righteous before the Lord. Thank you. I'm a hearer and a doer of the word of righteousness and I will see this come to pass in my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you that every one of us have ears to hear, ears to hear, and all the people out there, if they have not heard a message like this, they'll realize this is the truth, and they'll come to repentance on the spot and not believe any of these lying teachings any longer. But they will be doing what the Word says and see the righteousness be manifest in their life. Father, we praise you and thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.